Good day, Brandon. First of all, let me thank you for doing this interview with me over Skype. Oh, well, it's my pleasure to be here, Guy. Thank you very much. For our audience, would you please introduce yourself and, first of all, tell us where you grew up, where you went to college, and what you studied before we get into the rest of your career progression? Uh, sure thing. So, uh, Brandon Carson. I grew up guy in a small town in New Mexico. Actually, I was born, believe it or not, in truth or consequences, New Mexico, primarily because my parents were driving through when I decided to uh, join the world. Um, but I'm from that kind of rural part of New Mexico. My dad was a printer. Um, and in fact, I became one too. I became the fifth generation uh, printer in my family. We were letterpress printers. So I spent a lot of time learning typesetting the old-fashioned way, uh, and then I got interested in digital typesetting uh, when it, uh, as soon as it became available. Then I moved into computers when I got a TRS-80 Radio Shack computer. Then moved to Apple IIc primarily because I couldn't afford the IIe, um, and then uh, onto the Macintosh. So as I as I said, I grew up in New Mexico. Went started college in New Mexico with a journalism scholarship actually at Eastern New Mexico. University, um, but then I dropped out. I was actually asked to leave because I had this thing about not wanting to show up for classes. Uh, so <laughs> it, that that had an impact on grades. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> so they literally just uh, told me I was flunking out. So then I left and went to California, and uh, then I finished my degree. I I did a degree in business, finished that in California, and actually finished it online. Um, and then ended up doing my master's degree uh, as well uh, in California. So, so that's that story. I've been in uh, learning for quite some time, mostly at tech companies because I lived in Silicon Valley. But before that, I designed college textbooks. So I, got, I was in publishing. Um, and I don't know if you remember, this was right before the Internet. Publish, when the Internet hit, publishing didn't know what hit them. I, I don't think today they still do. Uh, but that's when, so when I was at the designing college textbooks at the publishing company, the internet hit and we, we started reacting to the internet and trying to figure out what we needed to do there. And that's how I got into um, multimedia because we decided to start publishing or uh, creating multimedia supplements to the college textbooks. So I've always been in some kind of design related experience I, with my professional life. Uh, if there's one thing I enjoy, it's envisioning how good design can alleviate everyday challenges. Uh, before the term design thinking and even before usability, uh, there were a couple of, you know, became terms that we all know. There were a couple of key moments. Uh, Apple's human interface guidelines. Susan Kerr, who was, had a big impact on me, she designed Apple's um, so that they put on the Macintosh. She also designed a lot of their icons and their user interface. Um, and so those were, as I finished college and got into my professional career, first in publishing and then in multimedia, those are the uh, first things that had an impact on me as it, as it applies to design. Then we moved to Don Norman and the design of everyday things. Then we moved to Dieter Ram and his work for Braun had a big impact. Uh, they forged the tenets of usability, product design. Um, which, you know, at that time it was kind of interesting because everything was formulating around hardware and software. Um, and so anyway, design has informed me all along with everything I do. Um, so that's kind of my Genesis story, if you will. Yeah. I got into corporate. I don't know. You want me to talk about how I got into corporate? Yeah, no, I, I do. I, I want you to. I, so after college, uh, now I this is some things new that aren't on your LinkedIn profile, because when I looked at your LinkedIn profile, it seemed that you kind of started off with sun. But so, yeah, so yeah, there may be things before far, that. This was further back. Yeah, I'm going pretty far back, right? Before, before the Internet, right? <laughs> um, but we, you know, I got into corporate learning by mistake, quite frankly. I was working at that publishing company. We were doing the... Um, uh, working on the, the flagship biology book, which I, I was helping to design. It was the biggest selling book uh, that we had. And then we wanted a multimedia supplement with it for the professors because we sold to the professors back then. Um, we had a little budget, so we decided to do that multimedia supplement in-house. 
And so there was two of us that me and another gentleman, a colleague of mine, we were asked to do the, hey, can you guys work on the supplement, right? We don't have a lot of money, so we're going to do this in-house. And so he chose the director box that was sitting there. Remember Macro Mind Director, then Macro Media Director? The box next to it was Authorware. And I had no idea what Authorware was, but I chose Authorware because he took director. And so I would be actually putting it together in Authorware. He would be building the animations. And and so together we built the CD-ROM supplement for the biology book. And and after that, knowing uh, Authorware, I mean, I fell in love with Authorware. It just changed my life. So I kind of entered this space from that perspective, not from the instructional design uh, practice per se, but from the building and developing practice. And and I, I lament the day the days that Authorware went away. I mean, it was just the perfect tool for what we do. Um, I, the controversy over the flow line icon and or the framework icon, if you remember that, it was like, but anyway, I went to, I left publishing after that, after building that supplement because they laid us off. They were like, okay, now we're going to go do, do all this in Hong Kong design as well. So I moved into, went to work at a small startup at Silicon Valley. So tech company, the internet was hitting and tech companies were uh, clamoring to uh, think of different ways to do their training. Uh, so I took my little author box they gave me authorware they gave me that it was like ten thousand dollars back in the day and it was the mac version of authorware because authorware started on the mac right uh and uh took my authorware met tom king who uh had been a consultant with us on the program and tom king was running an authorware house and uh, he taught me he became a big mentor taught me so much uh can't thank him enough to this day he's the reason i'm in this career um, and, uh, then we, we, I went to a small startup and we started working for tech companies in the Valley. So, so then how did you, uh, get into sun? If we can start there and go through the progression. Yeah. Uh, sun was great. Right. So before that, when I went to the startup, we, we actually produced the first e-learning course for Intel and along with Tom, we implemented the first LMS learning management system for Tom because, Tom was one of the originators of what became LMS, really, if you think back in the days. He, uh, he had a product that uh, he called Pathway that he created, and actually IBM ended up buying it uh, and turned it into, uh, uh, actually, I, I'm sorry, Macromedia bought it, turned it into Pathware, uh, and then IBM ended up buying that and integrating it into Lotus Learning Space. So a lot of like old old style stuff. But after that, you know, it's the valley. There was a lot of the heady days of the internet, the rise of the internet. And there was just a lot of um, movement going on. I actually did 10, several years, almost a decade of just contracting and consulting in the valley, working with my authorware box, you know, I had it with my laptop and <laughs> would go and just work for companies, Intel being one of them. Uh, and then several other companies. And then uh, I got word of a position at Sun Microsystems that was sounded really interesting. And I was totally into the idea of open source and kind of what Sun was doing with software. Uh, and, and, you know, to this day, so I joined that company working with Kelly Palmer, who now is, is at Degreed. She's the chief learning officer at Degreed. But then she was leading one of the learning functions at Sun. So I came in under her and uh, it was just magical times. It was a great company. We we were just putting it all, building from you know the whole idea of what uh, online learning could be at Sun. So it was great. I, I spent a few years there. That was fun. I actually would be there now if Oracle hadn't acquired them. So. <laughs> all right. So then, where'd you go from Sun? Uh, so from from Sun, I was there a couple of years. I uh, it might have been about three or four years, I don't remember. Gosh, it's so long ago. Uh, Kelly, so Oracle came in, did the acquisition. Kelly went off to Yahoo. So I went with Kelly over to Yahoo and we did some time there. We built the training organization at Yahoo. They didn't really have one at the time, a formal training organization. So there were like four of us working on that, just putting it together. We, we were scrappy, pretty scrappy the first year. Um, and that was fun. It was great. It was, um, you know, it, towards the quite chaotic and problematic at Yahoo from their business model standpoint. Things were moving so quickly with Google and Facebook and stuff like that. So, it, But it was great. It was a great environment. There was so much going on inside that company that was good. They just couldn't figure out how to get to market with a lot of stuff and be competitive in that space. So we, it was, an, it was a bumpy road. We navigated it really well. We had a lot of fun 
uh, and then or uh, then Yahoo, uh, you know, through reorgs and all that kind of fell apart. So left there, um, left Yahoo and then did some work at Apple and then did some work at Microsoft. Um, in Apple, I was involved as an instructional designer at Apple, uh, involved in sales training, also trying to uh, open markets, different markets for iPad uh, at the time, iPad was pretty new, but they realized that the market for small and medium business was great for us. So stuff like that, um, and just worked with some more of the tech companies there um, until I got a call from Atlanta uh, Home Depot, who was interested in uh, reinventing their learning uh, strategy, having more technology, and getting more what I think of as performance support moving away from traditional training to how do we get more performance support in the in the aisle, we called it, right? Uh, learning in the aisle kind of thing. So came out to Atlanta and did that for four years, uh, had a great time, and then moved over to Delta where I'm at now. So, Well, uh, excellent. That's uh, So at uh, Delta, could, tell us a little bit about your role at Delta. So at Delta, I lead a team that's responsible for uh, all of the training for all of the employees that work in the airports around the world. So we operate in about 350 airports globally, um, and we have an employee base of about 30,000 that work in these airports. So my team's responsible for all of the training for these folks from their regulatory and compliance training to their customer experience training, leadership development, all of that. So we have quite a broad charter uh, for all of these uh, agents that we support. Very cool, thank you. Um, can you talk to us, uh, you, you've mentioned a couple of things, but can you talk to us a little bit more about some of the more interesting uh, things you've worked on in your career? I, I, and on LinkedIn, I saw that uh, uh, you had uh, the onboarding was uh, uh, something that you uh, highlighted in on LinkedIn. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. Even at Sun, so there was a period at Sun where uh, Sun was truly a a forward-thinking organization in some respects because we it was back in the day, which is normal now to be work at home, especially in the situation we're all in globally. But back then, uh, they were pretty much a work at home environment and it was not something that was uh, status quo back then so much. And so onboarding was quite an interesting challenge at a company like that. So we, so my team actually ended up, we, we designed one of the first virtual onboarding Experience, well, the first one that Sun had ever had. And we we really took that, we, we combined a lot of different elements. So we used wikis, right? If you remember wikis yep. back in the day, we, we built a wiki-based onboarding system that had some social elements. There were some social utilities uh, in, on, in, the, uh, in the experience that would basically help people acclimate and feel like they were part of a broader team. Although a, a lot of people there, you could start your job and never see your boss physically or go months without seeing the, the other people on your team physically. So it was an interesting ch and challenging um, uh, development of, of that experience because a lot of what we were thinking about back then uh, kind of predated the technology we had available to us. So the great thing about that environment one in a tech company is we had our own uh, IT department in learning. And so we didn't have to, to really work with the enterprise uh, IT. We had our own IT. So we were able to really do a lot and experiment a lot. And so we were able to build that, that experience. And in, in, that's the first time I also uh, used game-based learning for, uh, in my career. So we built uh, some, some game-based learning for the onboarding experience. And then we also had a strategy around integrating Second Life. So if you remember Second Life, the virtual world yeah. back in the day, yeah. Sun actually had nine, uh, we had nine properties in Second Life that we had purchased. And we were really going big in, in that. So we were, we were having a great time with just taking technology and seeing how we could apply it to, to learning. And so then that forged kind of my a lot of my philosophical thinking as it applies to learning. And that's I, about that time is when I got turned on to Tiagi, who after Tom King became just a huge influence on my professional life. I actually had the pleasure of being able to work with him for a couple of years and just really soak up as much as I could from him um, and, uh, and, and really try to apply game mechanics where he, he's the first person that told me learning could actually be fun. 
um, you know, corporate learning. And so that's when um, that just changed everything for me. And so then at Sun is also when I got turned on to Joe Harless. I hadn't really understood kind of the rigor and the science behind uh, human performance technology or, you know, and Russ Powell is, is one that, that really turned me on to Joe. Um, and, and I dug into to that and actually leveraged a lot of that for my master's program. Um, but that's when, that's when my segue from just, okay, I'm the authoring guy, the development guy happened to, to get really more focused on uh, applying the rigor and the science of learning to make sure that we were developing things that would have an impact uh, and that were measurable. So that was a really great time for me during that that period. Uh, and that's when, after getting turned on to Joe, I learned more about uh, Allison Rossett and actually got an audience with her at ISPI because she turned me on to ISPI, uh, told me about Gloria Geary and stuff like that. So, that, so then that's when I, I got to thinking about, okay, here's the science and rigor of performance-based, you know, learned gap analysis, I learned front-end analysis, all this kind of thing, all these, um, you know, the, the methodology that you need to apply to learning. And I fear that, I don't know, but I fear that some of that is getting lost when, uh, and I remember a moment in time when I think it was Macromedia that published some um, marketing materials about rapid authoring. And I remember back in the day, that was the start of the decline, what I call the dark ages of training. Oh boy, yes. Was when they started talking about one per, the tool will do it for you. And I used to have to, I used to have teams of like six or seven skill specific people that would come together to build uh, great CBT and CD-ROM and e-learning and you know all the delivery methods we could. And then it, and then I just saw the decline of the industry sort of move into that. Let's just crank it out and get information posted online and and all of that. And so I think that curve maybe is coming back a little. I am on um, the board of the, the a corporate board for. Georgia State's uh, program here on instructional technology, their master's program. And it is a little bit frightening to see what is being taught to today's, uh, in today's uh, graduate programs as it applies to learning and learning technology. And I think we do need to, you know, turn a little bit back. And I don't want to go on a rant here or anything, but I think we do need to turn a little bit back to the forefathers and the, the theory and the science behind what we do and apply more rigor to it. Um, but that, that moment with Tiagi also just those that time I had with him taught me how, okay, yes, the rigor and the science is critical and key, but there's also a way to apply, um, you know, serious fun was the term that I learned out of all of that to learning as well. And then the third component, if you add design to that, you know, the, the correct you know, using the foundations of user interface design and usability, then you've got the trifecta there. So, so anyway, it was all, all that kind of came together in just a few years for me, which has, you know, wasn't really a part of my master's program at college, but getting access to these people really changed everything for me. So. Well, those are some of my heroes too. So that's, uh, that's helpful. I was conflicted for a moment there because I thought, I want because I want to talk about your book, but I but you you shared with us a little bit about your first exposure to human performance technology, and I wanted to, you know, my thing is that, okay, you can call it evidence based practice for performance improvement or HPI human performance improvement or PT performance technology, and this is an issue for a lot of us in the business. How do we refer to this underlying foundational science of performance improvement, which includes instructional design kinds of things. But so how do you talk about that? So so you so one of my mantras over the years, so I, I do agree that we in this profession, and you know, I, I still use that term quite a bit, guy, the dark ages of training, because quite frankly, I, I've been, uh, over the past several years, I've been spending a lot of time talking to leaders in learning organizations I do think we are at an inflection point in some respects, but one of the key messages I've been trying to impart, if you will, or just my perspective, right, is that too often we have non-learning experts in uh, in uh, capacity or in positions of leadership in learning organizations. And sometimes it's just, let's put a business person over there or let's put a subject matter expert over there and they'll lead the learning function. And that, quite frankly, has led us down a really dangerous and rough path over the last decade, I think, where we we do not 
in as an industry, we are not rigorous about bringing forward the evidence of our value to the organization. And that's been the and that's been the challenge over the, all those years. We were kind of in the dark ages. And what's happened in the last uh, several years with the rise of the digital age and more uh, data gathering capabilities is like, okay, the data is there for us to provide our, our evidence, right, the, of value. So it's just now we need the skill sets and the capabilities to bring that forward and apply that, you know, gain insight from that data to really see that. So, but you're right, the foundations are still there. And I'm just, me personally, I refer to this as performance improvement. What we do is really about building capability. And and so I was brought in to do some work, a company called Teradata in California, and they were throwing out their old way of doing things because they had gotten a hold of Bob Mosher and Conrad Godfordson, and they, they were bringing in the five moments of need, and they were, they were applying the methodology across everything they were doing. And so they asked me to come in and, and consult with them, design types of, uh, uh, design types of uh, questions about how they were applying that. And that's when I got turned on to Bob. And to this day... It, Wow. Okay. So what I'm doing in our learning strategy, I did this at Home Depot, I did this at, uh, doing this at Delta, I've done this, you know, since I've learned it is, okay, how do we take and understand those moments of need and how do we, the learning organization, apply some type of uh, meaningful and relevant instruction at all those moments of need? And this has been quite transformational for the teams I've been involved in and working with. And these aren't necessarily the types of uh, the types of competencies that are being taught in these, like I mentioned, these master's degree programs. Where it takes a, re a, a really strong understanding of instructional design and the theory of adult learning to, for you to be able to apply across these different moments of need, if you will. And um, and if you think about it, it's like really the most of what our folks need. And this was in my book, actually. I had a uh, an interview um, with uh, oh lord I can't uh, I'm trying to think of the gentleman's name um, the I had an uh, what totally brain dead on his name but uh, Hegel sorry totally went dead on his name John Hegel who talks about what we what he calls exception handling and he said Brandon if you go out to your field folks or the folks that you support from a training industry and you look at their actual jobs they do and then you compare that to the training you provide. He said, I guarantee you that most of what you provide does not apply to them in their day-to-day -day tasks. And he, and he called that exception handling. They're dealing with things that are coming their way that you as the training person have no idea they're dealing with. <laughs> yeah. And you're not preparing them for that. And so he really blew me away in that interview. And I got to thinking about what Bob and Khan talk about in these moments of need. And Khan's great example about the criticality of the tasks you perform and how as an instructional designer in your analysis, you should really be applying criticality factors. You know, although I look at this as basic improvement, building capability, changing behavior, that's really what we're focused on. And so much of what I say when I say no now to the business is because what they're asking for is not training. Mm -hmm. It is either information dissemination or in kind of policy and procedure or it's some kind of just, uh, you know, high level uh, uh, noise about something not related to changing their behavior or improving their performance. Mm -hmm. So not to get all ranty about it, but those five moments of need really sort of set the st That's what we're doing at Delta. We're moving. I'm moving as much of this, quote, training as I can to as close to the work stream as possible. Um, understanding that most of what we create is just creating a lot of new content and it's training that is not being consumed and not being, you know, not relevant. The delivery method is not appropriate. So it's really at an inflection, most of us are at an inflection point. And to your point, I would argue folks need to go and understand Joe Harless, Allison Rossett, Bob Mosher, Con Godfordson. You just need to Google them. It's all there. Mm -hmm. Yourself, what you're, what you add uh, in on your blog and on LinkedIn, Clark Quinn, you know, people like that. That we need that foundational uh, understanding uh, to bring forward to what we do, right? So, anyway, long answer on performance improvement. Sorry. No, 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 no. That's, no. 
That was excellent. That's what I want. So I think now let's let's segue to your book. And I so hold your book up. And right. so learning in the age of immediacy. All right. So who is this written for? And what were you hoping to convey to them? So what will their takeaways be? Yeah, it, quite frankly, it's been a long and winding road. Um, it's, it's just a compendium of sort of my thinking in, um, on how the digital age is impacting the workplace, the workforce, and how L&D should really be uh, repositioning itself somewhat, if, if, you know, just to be kind of real about it. It's, it's a, a corporate L&D in a lot of spaces has just become uh, another HR function that's too far removed from what's really going on. And, and what's happening now is the digital age is impacting us so quickly uh, and really changing strategies from a business standpoint so quickly that uh, it's, it's really time for L&D to become much more um, involved in the day-to-day. -day. And so in the book, and the great thing about the book isn't me necessarily, the great thing is the um, people who have contributed to the book. So the book is is uh, really all about the edge technologies that are happening, that are driving the changes that are happening in the digital age, right, that are, that's impacting business. But we have John Hagel from uh, Deloitte's Center for the Edge in there. We have Tom King, who's – Tom King's uh, insert on mobile learning in there is worth the price of admission alone. Uh, he is a fantastic author. I've been pushing him. I'm like, dude, you need to be writing more books. Um, and then there's there's other folks that are contributing their viewpoints as well. Chad Udell has a lot to talk about on uh, virtual reality and, and uh, Internet of Everything, stuff like that. So, but really what it is, is a primer for just understanding how everything has changed. And John's point, Hegel's point is um, that there's no longer any level of worker. He, he's like, we need to stop using the term knowledge worker now because every level of worker will be interacting with technology from now on to get their job done. And so how, does, how do you as a leader in your L&D organization, so quite, quite honestly, it's written for those folks who are setting strategy, learning strategy. It's really useful for practitioners as well, but it's really to help you formulate what your strategy should be from an L&D perspective as it applies to all of the things going on in your business, which are really evolving quickly. Quick read, you can you know, sit on a plane and read it or a great nighttime reading. Uh, to, it's, it's a short read, but the, the contributors are really great. And uh, I try to keep the conversation going uh, on LinkedIn about it as well, um, because so much is changing so rapidly. So, Well, thank you for sharing that. Um, you've mentioned a couple of your your biggest influencers from back early in the day. Um, you've mentioned a lot of people, and but uh, so as a way to point newcomers to the field to people, you know, you've mentioned some people, so you can add some more if you'd like. But so some of your early influences, and I would, I'm interested in some articles or books that you might uh, reference. Uh, great, good question. So. Really, I'm, I'm, I'm really informed by uh, the design components. I, you know, when design thinking came across, I was working uh, with Bob Burnett at Stanford University, who runs the D school at Stanford, or did at the time. And uh, we, you know, design thinking from IDEO had just sort of come out as a practice moving beyond product design, right? And it... I looked at that as, okay, this isn't necessarily new. This is a compendium of like people I talked about earlier. There's Jacob Nielsen, there's Susan Kerr, there's Dieter Rams. And even, quite frankly, you could stretch this over to what Harless is doing, what Alison Ross had talked about, uh, Bob and Khan. Um, but there were two other folks who had a big impact, and, and they're coming more from the design area. And I would say for anyone new in this industry or coming into this industry, I would argue that you should read two books before you get to everyone else's. There's a lot to read when you get into this industry, but you should really look at uh, Edward Tufte's Visual Display of Quantitative Information. Uh, he, I don't know if he still does it. He used to go around and give these day-long workshops about information design and information architecture. He's got a lot of stuff on his website, tufte.com, T-U-F-T-E. Um, my God, the man is just amazing. He's very controversial. 
he has a brochure out on how he thinks, you know, he and he argues for this because he's evidence based. He argues for how PowerPoint uh, PowerPoint itself caused the Space Shuttle Challenger uh, disaster. And he had and he gives proof of that. And and so his whole mantra, his whole mantra is about uh, not obfuscating or corrupting information. And so it really applies to us in learning, right? Because we really know text in some degree, to some degree. So anyway, I think his stuff is great. He gets a little um, academic, but he's fantastic. And then the second person I would say is Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. His book on the flow theory really changed things for me. And he talks about He's a psychologist, but he talks about how we enter these states of flow that he, I believe he created that term. Uh, We enter these states of flow where we are completely absorbed and immersed into an experience and so completely absorbed into it that it's really hard to bring us out of it. And when I read his book, I was kind of blown away. And at that time, I was meeting Tiagi and Matt Richter and those folks. And I literally had the fortune to, I was fortunate enough to have an audience with some game designers. They were designing, um, back, in the, back in the day, some games for PlayStation and, and Xbox. And they actually mentioned Mihai as well. And they, they say that's the theory that they design games on. And if you look at how people play games, especially folks that get into those types of role-playing games, you immerse yourself into that and it's really hard to pull you out of it. So how do we do that for learning? How do we build learning experiences that bring about that flow connection for you that get you so immersed into the experience that you're uh, completely involved in it, right? So those two books, Edward Tufte's Visual Display of Quantitative Information and Mihai Csikszentmihalyi's Flow, uh, you, you should start there, I think, in my opinion. Excellent. Very cool. Thank you for sharing that. Let me segue here to yeah, as, as to help provide an example for others. If you were to give us a 30-second elevator speech on what you currently do, what would that be? Now, I typically set this up saying you're at a neighborhood party, there's a new neighbor, they come up to you and say, Brandon, what do you do? So, you know, what's the short and sweet response you might give to somebody like that? That's a hard one. Um I lead the team at Delta that's responsible for all the training for our airport operations around the world. Our charter covers all the regulatory training, the skills and performance-based training, and the leadership development and customer experience training. That's what I do, but you know, that's what I've done all my career. So it's, it's, it's all about building capability. I build capability. That's really all I do. <laughs> Well, thank Sorry, you. Sorry, not much more like interesting and fun. But that's, well, you are certainly one of the few that got that down under thirty seconds, even though I did not <laughs> time it. But uh, uh, most people struggle with that, and and so I, I think we have we've had this challenge of explaining to others what it is we do. Uh, my own personal experiences: I've had relatives who've challenged me and said, "How can you train people on some job that you've never had?" and there was this big thing with a uh, a colleague of Joe Harless, uh, the late Claude Lineberry, who used to get up at ISPI and NSPI conferences back in the day and and uh, for keynote speeches and read his letter from Mama. And he did this twice, where where his mother is confused about what he does for a living, and it's hilarious, of course. But but it's one of the That's challenges classic. that we have. So um, if you're talking to somebody in the business. And they were to ask you, you know, so what you're doing and you've given them that kind of a spiel or something similar to that because they're in the business, they have a little bit more knowledge about that. Where would you take the conversation to explain what's really important to you and what's really driving you? Now, you've explained some of that here, but, you know, again, to provide an example yeah. to our audience. That, that it, it's really in, it, it, interesting. I love the idea of that mom, letter from mommy, too. I want to see that. Um, I, you know, I'll share one thing that, that blew me away because this is really I'm informed by people like yourself and Matt and Tiagi, all these people I've met. I don't really know anything. It's just absorbing from all these other folks in this industry uh, and taking that and using it and leveraging it. So I was on a call once and Kimo Kippen, who used to be a chief learning officer, I believe at uh, Hilton. Uh, I hope I got that right, Kimo. Um, I believe he's retired and is a consultant now, but he said something. I was talking about the what's going on right now with innovation in corporations, and a lot of corporations are bringing in chief innovation officers or chief, you know, 
uh, areas of the function just focused on innovation, right? Mm -hmm. And he kind of blew me away when he said, you know, they need to stop doing this in the in the marketing function or in the technology or information officer function. They need to do this in the HR function because learning and HR, but learning definitely, we're focused on the people. And so we are the center, really the best center of innovation in making sure innovation is spread across the enterprise because we build capability across the enterprise and we're focused on the people elements. And that kind of blew me away and he's right. It's like too many of us as leaders in learning and HR functions are not stepping up to the plate to take on that role of let us drive the innovation. And a lot of it is because we may not understand or be uh, competent enough or have the, you know, the technological background or whatever. And that's where we need three key focus areas in our background. And this is what I would talk about. We need to be, we need to understand the science of learning deeply. We need to understand technology and its impact on the business. And we need to understand business. We have to have those three competencies to be in learning. So explaining what we do in, in a short amount of time is, is difficult because chemo led me to think, we are the, the, this is probably, and I would say this for Delta, quite frankly, we are the most important function when it comes to making sure the operation can operate, right, can run, because we're building the capability in the people, and quite frankly, in some respects, in the non-people elements, because we're, they're combined a lot of times to do what they need to do to make the company run. And I think that's where L&D needs to step up to the plate and realize that more often or position themselves better for that. And I think that's why it's hard for us to explain what we do in a short amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> and of course, everybody is so familiar with education having been through the system, which are, wherever they uh, went through their system, they, everybody thinks they have a good handle on what that is. I yeah. mean, how hard oh. could it be to come into the front of the room and just preach? Oh, you know, and, thank uh, you. <clears throat> I don't know how many times I've heard that, even in the business functions. Oh, we got this. We'll do that. Yeah, mm -hmm. we, we just, you know, we just got to give the information across. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, I, you know, I've, I've said before that, you know, if we have, ISD shops, ID shops inside companies, we need a communication shop because sometimes people, you know, our clients just want to make people aware. They don't necessarily want to make them knowledgeable, deeply knowledgeable or skillful. They really want to communicate something. And if the audience has the right prior knowledge, they're just leveraging off of that. So there is a, there's yeah. a time and a place for that. But too often, yes. that's the easy route. Because that takes right. a lot less time. It's a lot less expensive because you gave me a price for all three options, awareness, knowledge, and skill. So I went with the cheaper option, hoping and praying yeah. that, you know, that I, the audience is, is, has enough knowledge to be receptive and take it in and then change their behavior, change their performance. But, yeah, you're, com you're uh, completely <laughs> spot on. You know, at Apple, just a quickie, at Apple, we, we were in sales training non-U.S. sales training. So we dealt with the rest of the world outside of the U.S., but we reported up to marketing. Mm -hmm. And so we had to spend a lot of time making sure that this was really training and not just marketing jargon, right? And, yeah. and, and there was good and bad, that, you know, there's good and bad to that, but we had to, and so that's sort of what I argue now is as a learning leader, look at where you're positioned in the org structure, look at where you can have the most impact, uh, in not only your structure but also what your skill sets are on your on your team. Uh, it's not an easy job right now. And I remember years ago someone saying, "Oh, the death of the ID. We won't need instructional designers at some point." And, I'm, and I've always thought, "No, work is going to get more complex. It's not going to get lot less complex, and we're going to need that rigor that only an ID can bring to that." So <laughs> here, here. <laughs> yeah. As uh, let me shift gears here again. Uh, as a lifelong learner, can you share with us what your current or next focus is for learning? And then uh, there's so that's part A of the question. And then the second part is: Are you doing any writing? And can you point us to, you know, what you may be sharing about that? Or it may be a little bit too early because you're still early in the learning curve. So where where no, are you at? What are you focused on? I'm actually work. Yeah, you're right. I'm actually working on a couple things there. So my and I've touched on it a bit during our, our talk today. My mantra now is really to, to look at, like I said, we're at an, I think we're at an inflection point, quite frankly, in this industry. I think the next five years is going to be much more active to us in L&D than the last. I think we're at a point where 
to meet the needs of our of the changing workplaces and workforce have to start having. And I think our industry is really starting to have those. There are the change agents coming forward. I think we need to have more discussion about building into the actual work environment and the work systems. Help in learning. We're learning's all, is too often over here. The works, the work environments are constructed without us being a part of that. And I'm talking about health and wellness, the actual systems themselves, the environments. I remember when Steve was designing the new Apple corporate complex. He was designing learning into the complex, and he was into the construct, into the architecture, and he was designing it so that people would be able to engage with each, with each other and learn from each other. And, and I think L&D needs to have that competency. So I think we need to reimagine what we bring to the value proposition from a business perspective. And that's the subject of the book I'm writing now, uh, which is really more along the lines of reimagining where our impact really lies and where it needs to lie as we go forward. We're Too often we're just sort of sitting in cubicles building rectangles that we call e-learning with just a text and a photo. And I think we need to just blow it up, you know, and, and show our value in a different way uh, as business evolves. And so that's a playbook that I'm in. The book is actually that it's a playbook for L and D in the digital age. So Very cool. Very cool. Let me shift gears again here. Um, I, so my next question, is there a favorite, performance improvement term or phrase that you would like to define for us. And I, I often uh, position this as a, perhaps it's not a favorite term, perhaps it's one of the more annoying terms or phrases because we have a language issue, as I'm sure you would agree, in our field. And yeah. so here's an opportunity for you to take a term or a phrase and put your spin on it because people are either misusing it, it's being misconstrued out there in the marketplace, and and if you have more than one phrase or term that you'd like to take on, please do so. But what, what do you have for us? So so I'll I'll share a story about how I actually kind of caused a little bit of a hiccup and headache at Delta. So we have a lot of what we call job aids, right? So there's these job aids, tons of job aids that we produce and that are out there available. And they're not well, they're not easily available because if you think about airport operations, people are in an airport moving around, you know, and, and then we have these job aids that are available and not an easy way to access them, right, on a, on a website. Um, and so I was looking at a lot of these and actually brought Russ Powell in to help us think about how we're designing these. And, and he's got this, uh, he's got this uh, process for what he calls damn good job aids, right? Mm -hmm. And it was just kind of bothering me using this word job aid. And so I said, well, what are we really trying to impart here? We're trying to show people, like step action tables, we're trying to show people kind of process or procedures, you know, really about procedures more than that. And so I changed the term job aid because I'm lucky to sit in this position where I can just change terms, right? <laughs> and like you said, create new terms, right? <laughs> so I say, okay, now job aids are not job aids anymore. They're skill guides. So we're going to create skill guides. And so we started to make that change, but then we realized the word, the term job aid is so infused into our system mm. that by calling this a skill guide, I didn't even realize what I was doing as a leader. I was causing a major disruption in all of our systems because job aid is a term that people understand. And I wanted to modernize that with skill guide, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's not exactly what you're asking, but it's almost <laughs> like you're, you're right. Our nomenclature learning is the acronyms. We are probably the worst industry other than maybe the government and Department of Defense um, with acronym heavy or term heavy. And you're right. We use a lot of terms. We cross utilize them to mean different things, competency, capability, knowledge transfer. And I think, quite frankly, because, Guy, we do one of the hardest things there is to possibly think of doing, and that's to try to transfer knowledge from one human to another. And that that is not an easy task, right? We know, we don't know how to, I remember reading something recently, a scientist said, you know, we are born ignorant and inept, and we actually don't get much further than that through our lives. We still haven't figured out the big questions. We don't know the universe, the history of the universe. We don't know the story of the universe. We don't, we haven't solved cancer. As a, as a species, we're pretty inept and ignorant, and we try. We don't know how the brain works completely. We think we, you know, we're trying to apply rigor and science to it and all that. 
So you're right. That's why all these terms and these mix this this. So I caused a big, and I'm like, okay, we probably just need to go back to Java to make it easier. Skill guide, right? So, Is that what you did? <laughs> go back to Java? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Let's well, stick with what works, right? In learning, we don't need to change it just to modernize it necessarily. <laughs> well, I think that's that's uh, key. Uh, you mentioned earlier we need to go back and we need to understand the forefathers and foremothers of our of our profession here and what they taught us. Um, and some of this, you know, some, sometimes it's good to change a term or a phrase or whatever to, to refresh it because maybe it's taken on a bad connotation and we need to yeah. escape from it, but take the essence of it and, uh, you know, move along and just change. And that yeah. causes issues. But then there's the You're marketing right. aspect and I've got to change. You know, I remember Gary Rumler uh, and Joe Hartless actually explaining this to me that they were all very competitive. The Rumblers, the Gilberts, the Harlesses, the Bob Magers, um, mm-hmm. the, the, the people who were at the beginning of NSPI back in the day. And they were, so they changed all the terms. So the term job aid, you know, in the 70s and 80s from Harless was really guidance from Gilbert and Rumler back in the 60s and 70s, and then, you know, Gloria Gary came along with electronic performance support systems where it's all embedded, and so that became a new phrase, and then we've got performance support, and we've got, uh, um, you know, there, I mean, a lot of this is just, you know, yeah. junior SOPs, if you will. They're not as right. perhaps as rigorous as uh, and critical as right. an SOP, but, right. they're, but they're still there to provide guidance. So Yeah, you're, you're right. And if you look at today, a lot of, you know, data science has brought forward a whole new kind of um, uh, lexicon, if you will, around data itself and big data and learning analytics and learning data and like what what means what when we need to apply evidence, right? And mm-hmm. I got the first thinking around evidence from Allison, quite frankly. She she just taught, and her and Frank Nguyen were writing a book together, I think, back in the day. I was at ISPI in Dallas when they were kind of doing their thing. And and that's when I actually did my uh, analysis certificate program, if you will, was because they were there. Mm-hmm. But, you know, at the end of the day, I always say this, data democratizes your decisions. And so... Regardless of how you, and this is in learning, and I think this is what would scare a lot of our learning leaders and maybe our practitioners, if you really were able to get the meaningful and insightful data back from what you do, it might be a little scary to realize what you're doing is probably not the right thing, and and it's hard to change that behavior. But if we just spent some time understanding in the right way what what role data can play in our profession then that would change everything. And I think we would, could do, back to John Hagen's comment, we could do a lot less of what we do and we could do less of more is like what I like to say, right? Because we're just, we're just content creators in some respect, right? We're just creating more content. And so I think you're right. Now with all of AI and automation and, and some of these new technologies that have sprung forth, it's bringing a whole new lexicon to our industry. And of course we like that because we like to take all these things and just, I I literally have sat in conference rooms with senior leaders and I know some jargon I can throw out and then there'll just be heads nodding and then we can end the meeting and I can go back to what I was doing. (laughs) Please, oh, let's hope that they don't watch this. Um, (laughs) I mean, it's a huge challenge and you're right that the, there's an onslaught of new perspectives, the technology, the evolution of the technology is bringing us more affordances or utilities. Yeah. And right. so it's just overloading us. And for somebody new yeah. coming in, it's just can be overwhelming. Yeah. And too many come in from just the technology standpoint. And, you know, I, I know I'm a gray beard now. Um, I, but I, I remember, not having a lot of technology, quote, you know, pre-internet, pre-computer, and, mm-hmm. and shoot microfish and, you know, those kinds of things and slides that yeah. you literally project, you know. And uh, but, but at the end of the day, all the technology does is it's just a tool to use in the right capacity, in the right moment, if you will. And I think that's the rigor part you and I go back to. The human can never be lost because that's the great thing about our job is yes, we're going to need to apply technology in the right moment to get the information across however we need to do that. 
but that human element is always key there. And that's why this is such a great industry to get into because at the end of the day, yeah, there's more, there's going to be intelligent machinery and robots and software that, that really make up a lot of how work is done, but it's always going to be involving humans too. So Mm -hmm. (laughs) you can't forget that. Yeah. I like, I like the quote from uh, the late Don Toasty that all performance is a human endeavor. So we're all, oh, we always that. have yes. to we always have to recognize that, uh, and that's why I like the term HPT, Human Performance Technology, because it's really all about the performance. Whether we've got a bulldozer or a jet aircraft to yep. ease the human burden to get yeah, you're things right. done. You're um, right. That's, that's all three of them. That's human. That's performance, and that's technology. You're right. Mm-hmm. You're right. Yep. So let me shift gears again. Uh, this this question, uh, which I shared with you before we started this was to explore some of the more uh, some, some more about the people who have influenced you regarding your early practice and perhaps your later practices. So, and you've mentioned uh, quite a few names here, which is I, I'm thankful for. Uh, but can you share with us any uh, stories or shout outs that you have for people? Um, and again, we're trying to point the audience to people that they may want to follow up on. So if you've got some name to mention, if you could mention what you think others might get from them, uh, that would be most appreciated. Yeah, moving more to kind of the creative component. And I think why I say this is such a great industry to be in, because, yeah, we have and even in my job, there's, you know, we're we're a regulate we're a regulated environment. So. Our LMS is actually regulated by the FAA itself, right? It's a system of record that the FAA has oversight over. Mm-hmm. And so it's a pretty serious thing. But there are, so there's all this serious uh, compliance related training that's necessary for, for the business to operate. But there's also sort of that, like, how do you apply creativity to all of this qualification training or even the other types of training we do? And so that's what I love about this industry is that we have that rigor that needs to be applied to human performance, right? And evidence coming back that says, you know, someone is capable of doing the job, right? Um, But there's also like, how do you apply creativity to it? And I would say that a couple of people recently, just over the last several years that I got involved with was, and I I think you know Matt, Matt Richter. Mm -hmm. So Matt Richter and and Kat Coppett, and um, they both used to work together with Tiagi, but Kat introduced me to improv, improvisation, from a learning perspective, and she took us through some exercises at Sun, actually. We had a, all of our instructional designers at Sun go through a workshop with Tiagi's team, which included Matt and Kat. And Kat took these, you know, these are Java trainers. These are Solaris operating system trainers, very technical folks. And she took them through how to apply improv to learning design. And it was quite an interesting session where we had engineer types going through the these creative type of learning experiences right and i was holding my breath through this and so i would just and it was and it turned out fantastic they really it was a little uncomfortable but what i love about matt and kat both in that in that capacity was really making us uncomfortable and jolting us to try to see change our reality a bit and understand that there are different angles you can bring to this um to create an experience that can be life changing, life altering, and you know, and transferring knowledge and changing behavior. So, and Kat still to this day, she runs a, uh, I believe she runs a theater group in New York, and she wrote she wrote a great book about improv for learning. And she actually just won at Nasaga. She just got a, uh, uh, I believe it's an Eiffel Award for her. Uh, uh, for her contributions to the industry over over the years and so she's fantastic and of course matt all the time is fantastic because matt will uh come up with any kind of uh game-based activity to solve any kind of performance challenge in a flat like if you ask him matt i need an activity that will really help meet this objective and within 30 minutes an hour he'll have something for you and so i think Today, he's still, I remember back in the day when I was with Tiagi and Matt at a um, local ASTD back then meeting in California, which you would think is a little further thinking on some of this stuff. Tiagi and Matt were talking about game-based learning, and there were so many people, these are Valley people, so many people in the audience were like, oh, I could never do that. We can't have games in learning. That, that cannot happen. To, to see the evolution of that over the last 10 or 15 years has been amazing, and to be a part of 
of them. So I know I keep going back to that, but Matt and Kat are really, I mean, I would say look them up, right? It's- <laughs> exactly. So what I loved about uh, Tiagi and Matt and the, the whole crew that have worked with Tiagi over the years is that while they don't take too many things seriously, they take the end performance seriously. And that's what a lot of people miss. They, they get hung up in the, the game and the funds activity and yeah. of course, you you know you can have fun in doing some of this when you get in the flow, when you get so immersed in something that you you know you really can't. It's hard to extract yourself from that. But uh, yeah, and, yeah, and even from a facilitation standpoint, I did a session just as a participant with Tiagi. It was a one-hour session where he literally facilitated ten activities, and so it you know it, it even beyond to your point, even beyond just the. Uh, the the aspect of game elements and integrating them into learning, just how he facilitates and how he builds an experience, um, and I you know quite frankly I mean I'm I know I'm not I'm 55 I'm not the youngest guy on the on the block here probably but uh, when I talk about him now and he's 82 now but when I talk about him now to younger folks they're not they're like who and so I think it's I think it's important for us in this industry to and I think this is kind of what you're doing here with this this inter- these types of interviews for us to share you know what came before so that folks can get a good understanding of uh, oh hey Allison I need to look at she retired now but she's you know she had a big impact and Tiagi he's not retired but hey this is what you need to look at this some of the books you need to look at and stuff like that I think that's uh, part of our job now right as we're yeah. the elders history right well i think that's and so yeah when you said that and i that i just immediately reflected on on the old guard as i called them the rumblers and the harlesses and the makers you know lamenting that nobody understood their influencers that nobody had any respect knowledge you know they didn't understand the history of blah 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 you know and so you know i feel like okay i'd you know, turn that it, corner here, and I. It is and I'm part of our camp. job, though. You're right. It's part of our job. I had a, uh, someone on my team yesterday ask me about Lectora. Right? She's like, I've heard of this thing called Lectora. Do you know what that is? And I'm like, Yes. The person I live with was the sixth employee of Trevantis, right? As they were building that software. So let me tell you about that. Or anytime I can talk about Authorware, and you know, with the, I understood what Macromedia was doing when they tried to take Authorware to the web, and they got down to one engineer at Macromedia, and then they were just killing the tool and moving to Flash. And I honestly will tell you for the rest of my life, guy, that when Authorware died and people moved to Flash was the start of the dark ages of training, you know, and it, and I know I sound like that old guy ranting with the white socks, you know, like old Clint Eastwood in the yard with the shotgun, but that, that we have not come back completely from that. And I get it. It's a tool, but it was a tool built for what we do. And now we spend a lot of time trying to re-architect tools that weren't built for this to make them do what we want them to do. So, mm-hmm. yeah, In many ways, we're opportunity rich. So any other people that you'd like to talk about or do a shout out, people that, again, were influential to you maybe in the early days? You mentioned a lot of those. Or maybe some people who are, you know, more recent. Because Tiagi and Matt Richter certainly are not recent. No, and, you know, one of the guys I've been working with for uh, quite some time, Chad Udell, he he's written a couple of books. He's actually got uh, one out, a recent one out, The Shock of the New, which actually talks a little bit about what we've been talking about, which is how you can integrate technology into your functions from a learning standpoint. And he's actually a really different kind of thinker as well. He's got a company called Float Mobile Learning. Uh, he actually came in at Home Depot and built out our mobile learning uh, experience that we put together for our associates, uh, which is is in all the stores uh, now. He had a big impact on that. It was really help helping to architect that. And what the what he brings and people of his generation, quote if you will, what they're bringing forward is this mashup of all these things I've been talking about, which which is you know technology, business, design. Um, and how you how you that the confluence of all of those things together and how they go to build a uh, an experience that's conducive to learning. He doesn't think of it sometimes as necessarily building a learning app. Um, he's thinking of you know he thinks of it in a different way, and that's what I like because he brought this this idea of why are you building something separate? Why aren't you building these experiences into the systems that they already use and stuff. So I would say, look him up. He's a, he's a, a different thinker, you know, mm-hmm. and what we need in this industry. 
Yes, I just did a video with him uh, uh, last week. Oh, you did? Yes. Yeah, so, so people can go go check that out. Uh, any final people here before we get to our wrap up? Yeah, I mean, you know, I'll mention Russ again because we've been mentioning, we've been talking to Russ Powell quite a bit, working with him at Delta. He's he's more of a traditionalist, but he's he's great because he brings a practicality to getting, uh, and he's got the, I think he's got an app about. Uh, you know, damn good job aids and how mm-hmm. you can build job aids that are that are impactful. And and what I would say he brings and and he is a, you know, uh, uh, he worked with Tiagi, but he's got his own consulting organization now. And what he brings is this this real practical approach to what job aids can bring you. And he literally and I think you even had something today or yesterday the old Joe Harless quote about there's all these fat learning programs, yeah. you know, just with a job, with a skinny job, aid just dying to get, get out of some, I'm, I'm really totally destroying that quote, but it, <laughs> that's what Russ brings is like Russ will bring forward. Hey, sometimes a, even a paper-based job aid gets it done. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so if I was to say anyone that's uh, still disruptive uh, with, with uh, practical, applications of learning it's Russ Powell I agree yes thank you well let me shift gears here then to our our wrap up uh, uh, Brandon thank you again so much for for doing this interview with me um, but for our audience uh, particularly uh, people new to the field do you have any parting words of wisdom or guidance for them as they enter into this you know whether they're younger or middle-aged or older yeah. gray yeah. beards like us um, yeah what would you what would you suggest? I, You've already mentioned where they should start reading. Yeah, right, right. But launching people, off but, from uh, there, so what you know, what I, counsel do you have for them? I would say, you know, quite frankly, remain vigilant and steadfast in advocating rigor and science behind what, what we do, <laughs> but also understand the value and importance of good design. What we do is critically important, uh, especially in today's age, where people at work are blasted with so much information and visual noise. It's our job to ensure true opportunities for learning uh, get through to them um, and that it impacts the bottom line. And so I think, again, I'll go back to that, the rigor of science of learning, the understanding of business. You need to speak the language of business and not the language of learning when you're when you're uh, advocating what you need to do within the organizations. And, and really just be have a perspective. And take that perspective forward, and uh, you listen to that mantra I have of data democratizes your decisions. Leverage data; it's available to you now in more ways than it ever has been. Um, and coming into your organization as a new learning expert, you know you've got a lot on your palate that you can access to help you gain that perspective. But once you have that, then that's if it's based on the rigor of learning science and it's based on technology and what's happening today, you've got to understand it. You can't be afraid of it. Uh, and, uh, and then you apply that to business, then the sky's the limit. So, Excellent. Thank you. Brandon, thanks so much for sharing your wisdom and insights with us today. Um, I wish you well in getting through our uh, pandemic challenges as uh, all of us are facing here. This is the time of year. I didn't want to talk too much about this because I didn't want this to be timeless. Yeah, no, it's interesting <laughs> right now, but thank you so much. It's great to talk to you. I love going down memory lane. This is fun. Um, and and uh, I really, really enjoyed it. So I could do this all day, guy. I guess you j- you need to hit the stop or we could just go all day, right? <laughs> well, I'll do that in just a couple of seconds here. But uh, Brendan, again, thanks so much. You have a great day. You too. Thank you very much.